Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Methane Pavilion at COP26. My name is Alfredo Miranda, and I'll be hosting this panel this afternoon. Um, it's uh, my honor to introduce to you uh, Benjamin Matzik from Apt Associates, uh, Olga Gassensade from Carbon Limits in Norway, and Christoph McGlade uh, from the International Energy Agency. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, as everybody knows, uh, it's been a wonderful week for methane in the world. Uh, the Global Methane Pledge has been announced um, and has been signed for more than 100 countries. And now is a time where we have to think how to implement the methane reductions on a massive scale. Um, we want to make sure that every country is able to access the knowledge that is already out there, that the experts have already put for others to use, and we want to share that for everybody to see. Uh, it's not, um, as others say, it's not rocket science. Um, and there's a lot of people here to help you. And we want to make sure that everybody knows that. Um, so I will just uh, start with a very basic question, if that's OK. Um, if everybody can just tell me a little bit about what tools um, your organization has developed, um, that, would be, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm first? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, Apt has developed several tools that are available uh, uh, will be or are currently available on the Global Methane Initiatives website. Uh, the first is a solid waste emissions estimation tool we call SWEET. Uh, and that tool is a policy planning tool for the waste sector to plan how to mitigate or reduce methane emissions with different waste management strategies. Okay. The second tool is called an anaerobic digestion screening tool. And that tool uh, is, is obviously about anaerobic digestion and how to mitigate methane or how anaerobic digestion can mitigate methane with uh, in a, with that technology. And the third tool is a landfill project screening tool, uh, which you know it helps you see if your landfill uh, can support landfill capture and mitigate methane leaking from the man landfill. OK, OK, wonderful. Um, Olga, please. My turn. Um, Carbon Limits has raised philanthropic funding uh, to develop a tool that would allow um, national oil companies to um, develop complete uh, methane inventories. Um, based on their activity data and based on um, their measurements, if they're conducting measurements. Um, and the result will be completely compatible uh, with OGMP 2.0 reporting. Um, and uh, we are currently implementing it already now with, uh, um, with several uh, national companies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting. We discovered that a lot of the time they actually have the data, but they're using it differently. They're using um, activity information to account for losses of gas, for example. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, the differences in methodologies or approaches. Um, but, you know, looking at it as methane and looking at it also from the point of view of mitigation, um, people who are doing it in the companies, um, they, um, you know, they encourage. Um, it's a lot of insight into their operations um, and they sort of see uh, where the opportunities are. Um, and it's, of course, very important if they take on um, uh, if they uh, uh, take on uh, some initiative or a uh, reduction target, um, that's the most critical instrument that they will have yeah. to track their progress. So that's uh, what's what we do. You said that there was uh, sorry. Uh, you said that there was one tool. Uh, is it just it's it this is one. what is okay. the, the yeah. tool I'm talking about. Yes, it's one tool. Mm. It's called Mist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's an online platform that allows them to collect the data yeah. also from their regional divisions. Very often, for example. Oh. Um, it's not the corporate headquarters that collects the data, it's the regions. Yeah. And then this tool allows them, each, each region, to upload basically data. And then the headquarters get a much better, more detailed and discrete picture of what is happening in the company um, than they could otherwise. Oh, OK, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, Christoph? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, first of all, just before answering the question, just to say congratulations to you and your colleagues at the Clean Air Task Force on the Thank Global you. Methane Pledge. I know it was a massive team effort, and, <laughs> and you were you. front and center of it, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, at the International Energy Agency, um, we do a number of different things. Um, one of them is on transparency of numbers. So there is an issue I'm, we've been discussing a lot throughout this week is that we don't know the full scale of the problem. We know it's a problem for methane, but one thing that's held action back is not having, not having numbers, not really being able to, to, to pinpoint things. One thing that we l wanted to do at the IA was to put out the best estimates that we could do. And Olga and I have been <laughs> discussing throughout the week that these numbers are not perfect. But we want to say this is yes. our best estimates that are out there. And 
please let us know if you disagree with our numbers or you've got better estimates, but you know, it's a starting point. And having that information, I think, is a very useful starting point to be able to, to get towards uh, mitigation. The other thing that we have done recently is on developing pathways towards mi uh, mitigation. To, we put out a, a roadmap um, a few months ago called our Net Zero Pathway. Mm -hmm. This was how the world as a whole can get towards net zero emissions by 2050 mm -hmm. in line with the 1.5 degrees um, limiting climate change. And a key part of that was having a substantial reduction in methane emissions, mm -hmm. and methane emissions from oil, gas, and coal operations in particular. Yeah. So we had a 75% reduction in fossil fuel operations, in the meth methane emissions from fossil fuel operations by 2030. And then subsequent to that, we put out a, a roadmap and, a, and a, a set of a toolkit for countries and regulators who want to take action on that, who want to bring about policies and regulations in line with that 75% reduction. So we've developed this toolkit. It's, it's available. It's online. Anyone can download it. And it goes from the full, the full spectrum of if you're coming at this with no knowledge of your methane emissions in your country, but you want to do something clear about it, here's the steps you need to go through, or here's the steps you can go through to get towards a, a, a kind of a concrete, explicit, and ambitious reduction target on methane. So that's one of the other areas that we've been, we've been working on to help encourage action on methane emissions from, from the energy sector. And I understand that this is based on... Um experiences that you've gathered in different countries that yep. have already, or different jurisdictions that have already gone through this process? Absolutely, so this is, what I was talking about there was what we call our regulatory roadmap, this yep. kind of how-to guide and to go from, from nothing to a very ambitious target. But supporting that, behind that, is what we call our, our, our toolkit. Yep. So this drew on examples from different countries. So, you know, what is a certain country? How do they approach this problem? Because one of the important things to recognize here is that we're now in a stage where we've got a lot of knowledge we know what works in terms of what policies work, what regulations work, what technologies work to drive down emissions. And so we can learn from each other if we, if we, talk, if we talk to each other. And so this toolkit, one of the aims of it was to say, look, here's, here's how other countries did it. You know, here's, here's the things they lent on. There's not one size fits all. There's not one solution that will work for everybody. But you can draw on the existing examples and what worked and what didn't work to help form your own opinions and your own views as to how, how to tackle a problem. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, what I'm seeing here is that there's a lot of complementary tools out there and different points of view. Um, so I think that's wonderful. Um, I think it's a good time for me to also speak about a tool that CATF has developed very briefly. Um, it's called Comat. It's uh, sort of similar to what Olga has mentioned, but it's more focused on uh, governments, not necessarily on national oil companies, but it's, um, it's an Excel-based uh, product uh, that governments can use to quickly uh, and fast uh, input data on their infrastructure, on their activity data, on their type of equipment, and know sort of the magnitude of the problem. Um, the main benefit of this is that they're able to see everything um, because it's sort of a transparent uh, tool. And it also allows them to then build a mitigation program uh, using best practices um, as uh, Christopher has uh, been saying uh, the U.S. and Canada have sort of led the way in this thing, um, in, this, in this subject. And so uh, using sort of the best tools that we can, uh, we try to model how much methane reduction could be achieved uh, with this tool. Um, so I'll sort of go on to the next uh, question. Um, what, I mean, what barriers are we trying to overcome with these tools? No? What are we trying to solve? Um, and please feel free to take your time because <laughs> okay. I know that you have several... I have uh, lots of tools. <laughs> you have lots of tools and uh, we're focusing I a lot on uh, oil and gas methane because it's super cheap to abate. Uh, you get back your money and we have all the technology to solve that right now. Um, but we know that we're also looking at other sectors. So please... Uh, well, uh, for ahead. the tools that we've developed for the Global Methane Initiative, the, all, all of them in the... What they're trying to do is a lot of regional or municipal governments you know, want to help clean up their waste sector, but they don't really have the resources of national governments. They, they don't really know how. They, they, lack, they sometimes don't have the education. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the tools and the financial planning. They can't find financial resources because a lot of the funding out there in the universe of green energy funding is targeted at large regional or national infrastructure projects, but doesn't target the municipality that just needs a $10 million anaerobic digester. Yeah. Uh, so 
what these tools are designed to do is m empower municipal governments to have the resources they need to plan their, for their waste sector. Uh, right now, Suite, the, uh, the first tool, Suite, has, has been used in 53 different cities around the world to plan uh, policy or, or practices that they could help mitigate methane emissions with. Uh, the, that one is currently available, an old version of that tool is currently available on the CCAC's website, but it's being moved over to the GMI's website. That tool has been around for a few years. The newer tools, the anaerobic digestion screening tool and the uh, landfill project screening tool will be available on the Global Methane Initiative's website. And those are, again, sort of meant to be once you've run your suite, you've analyzed your waste sector, you say, okay, if we build a network of anaerobic digesters in our community, we could uh, you know, mitigate a million tons, uh, 10 million tons, whatever it is of, met of methane emissions, uh, and then you can screen your, w your waste stream to see, okay, could I make a project work? Okay. Uh, will it produce enough biogas that I could have a sustainable project? Uh, and then the fourth tool of ours, which I forgot to mention, is an organ it's called Organics. It stands for Organic Economics. Uh, uh, and that is a tool that you can sort of assess the financial viability of an, or an or organics management project, either composting or anaerobic digestion, to see you know, if this project will be sustainable. And then the goal, again, is to sort of give municipal policymakers uh, you know, tools so they can do a, a first order estimate on their own before they approach the engineering firm, before they approach the, uh, you know, the uh, design firm, before they go to an EPC contractor, so they can test what other experts are saying on their own and help sort of design projects and manage projects on their own. And is this something that they would themselves be able to do with these? Like, yes, we yeah. tried. We've really tried to make the tools user friendly, easy to understand, digestible. They're all in Excel, so you know, as long as you have a kind of a basic understanding of how Excel works, you can download them and use them. Uh, we've, you know, they all are designed to sort of feed into each other. So you'll see common colors and common input tabs, and so they're not. I, you know, how many government tools out there that it takes hours and hours and hours to understand them, but these are very streamlined, simple tools that I think most people who have a little understanding of methane, a little understanding of Excel can pick up and sort of understand how to reduce emissions in, in their communities. Well, I think this is fantastic because, as you said, it empowers uh, local officials who generally have less resources, have very big problems, big responsibilities, and uh, it affects a lot of people directly. So it's an easy way to, for them to try to look for a solution, right? And yeah, and also we forget how big our cities are, I think, especially with waste. Like uh, I've seen some, you know, students do model runs for cities in Asia that are the size of small countries. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that we can do in our cities and all, you know, it's going to take everyone on the planet, subnational governments, national governments, regional governments, individuals to kind of make this transition happen. And yeah. in sometimes, you know, especially where I'm from, the United States, you know, if you're in an area that is very hesitant towards making change, but you live in a city, maybe your city can make change and ignore the larger regional or national efforts. Uh, so it, it, we, we're really just trying to empower people to have resources. Yeah, and just to be clear, this can be downloaded by anybody, right? Um, yes, not so all of them. They, if they're, they're not all of them are posted yet, but they will be in the next few weeks. In so the next few weeks. If you're watching this, hopefully in <laughs> over the holidays or something, that you will, uh, they will be up there by then, I guess. Okay, wonderful. That's yeah. great news. Um, Olga, sort of the same question. Like uh, working with national oil companies, how do you? What barriers are you overcoming? Well, I would say four different types. You know, you have information. Um, then um, it's awareness and capacity action and reporting. With information very often, you know, the, the capacity of, um, of uh, the national oil companies you know, is usually quite low. Um, and they, they struggle for information. It's very helpful for them when they actually live and then they see the result. Um, so they, uh, they become more informed. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is in the, cap in, the, in the process, the capacity is being built. Um, they uh, obtain data. The data they already have, but it's, it's different. Maybe it's enhanced. If somebody was, was talking before um, just on, on the measurements, right on the surveys, please. They might uh, have had hosted several surveys so they can update the actual activity data and implement the results of the survey in the data so that their inventories are improved. 
um, that uh, also when, you, when they see them, the data by category, you know, um, then they see where the problems are, like what, what are the largest emission sources? What is that that they can try to work on? What we can also, also help them is say what's the most economical way of reducing um, methane emissions in the, in the specific categories. Um, so that allows them to estimate what the mitigation potential is. Mm -hmm. It allows them to take action. Hopefully, maybe, maybe also I think make some pledges, maybe, but, yeah. but internally at least, set internally, maybe not pledges, but sometimes they start thinking, well, what can we do about it? They do, there is absolutely strategic thinking. The moment they start working on it, there starts to be strategic thinking, okay, but what are we doing about this? Where are we going? They might not go public with it, but, but there'll be people sitting on strategic committees and management thinking what they can do with this, right? Um, and most importantly, it's reporting. It's reporting to national authorities that becomes part of the national inventories, mm -hmm. um, that becomes part of the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. transparency framework. Um, and uh, um, also reporting to a GMP. And we have one company that we've been working with um, that has joined a GMP on the basis of you know having the confidence that they can report because they have tools and knowledge um, that they can use to report. So I really like what I'm hearing. Um, you're helping oil companies be basically more responsible about how they're managing the resources. Um, you are putting on the table the environmental factors. You are helping them probably have some key performance indicators associated to methane and making sure that they're measuring these with time uh, so that they can have a better performance every time. Um, so no, it, this is fantastic. Um, sort of similar question, maybe not national oil companies, but <laughs> what, what barriers, I mean, what, what are we solving here? It's, a, it's an important question, I mean, perhaps it's a little bit of history. I mean, we've been looking at methane emissions and particularly methane emissions from the energy sector because we're an energy um, agency for uh, not at least 10 years now, at least a decade. About a decade ago, I think the key barrier was a lack of understanding that this was an, this was an issue. Yeah. Everyone just said, oh, you know, we, we just don't know enough about it, we, therefore we can't do anything until we understand more. Things have moved very quickly over, over that period. I mean, particularly I'd say in the last couple of years, the, the, the understanding that this is a problem and the understanding that we can do something about it has really absolutely zoomed up. Now, part of this is because of transparency. You've now got satellites which can very quickly tell you that there is, there is a problem um, happening somewhere. Also because of the great work, for example, groups like Carbon Limits are doing where they go in and they say, look, this is a problem. You need to do something about it. All of those efforts have really kind of accelerated understanding that we need to do something about it. So we're in a slightly different place now than, than where we were. The key barrier I think that we're now going to face is how we translate that we need to do something about this into how do we do something about this. We've been emphasizing for um, a few years now that a lot of the emissions which occur in the oil and gas sector can be avoided cost effectively. Mm -hmm. Because methane, if you capture it, you can in many cases sell it. Mm -hmm. It's a valuable product. That can therefore pay for the cost of, of capturing it. That's a good incentive for, for companies if, if, they, if they do something about it. It's also a good incentive for, for countries because they don't want to waste their, their natural resources. But we're now kind of moving into a slightly different position, I think, that cost effective is good, but now we have the Global Methane Pledge. Mm -hmm. They also have to reduce their emissions because they've signed up to something which is about reducing their emissions. And so it's not just about saving some money, it's about actually achieving your long-term targets. Mm -hmm. And so we need to kind of get into that to the next stage of how do we bring about these, these reductions we think in the, in the IEA that oil and gas and coal has to be front and center of the methane pledge. 30% mm -hmm. in all sources, but we, we set out a pathway for 75% and, and the technologies and the policies and the measures which governments and com companies can take. So now it's about translating that into firm you know, regulations and policies. And that's why we, we've put together this, this toolkit and this, this roadmap. If you are clear about wanting to achieve the Glo Global Methane Pledge, do something on oil and gas, and here's the tools which you need to do that. And it, you know, there's, there is some groundwork which has to be laid. You have to understand what's going on in your country. You know, not, uh, the regulations and policies for a country which is, has got a national oil company is very different from one which has thousands of independent companies or one which is heavily dependent on a single IOC. You need to understand that kind of where you are today, and then that will help you 
come towards an, a, an idea or a set of regulations to help you get that, that pledge and pledge in place, which is in line with your long-term targets. Yeah, no, wonderful. Um, in our experience in CATF, um, when Jonathan and other colleagues and myself are traveling around um, before COVID, um, the f it, it was difficult to engage in a conversation because we can't see methane, as, we've all, as we already know. Like, we can see oil spills, but we cannot see gas spills. So they're like, okay, what are you talking about, right? And where are these and how big are they? So uh, at least for us, COMET has definitely been the tool that allows us to pinpoint to sources. And we know, okay, we know there's flares, no? We know that there's pneumatic devices. We know that there is uh, outdated equipment, right? Um, so it really helps to get the conversation going. Um, and it has allowed us to, as you say, move from methane is not a problem to methane is a problem and to the problem is here and we can actually solve it, right? Um, so we've, we've been moving along quite well. Um, before I ask my next question, there's something that I think I forgot to ask. Um, and uh, just to make sure that, I, I, that the, uh, the audience knows, Benjamin, can you please tell us why uh, the organics diversion is so important? Yes, I, I was actually was thinking that okay, too as we okay, were talking. Okay, <laughs> I should clarify. Okay, okay, okay. We have two okay. oil and gas, premium yes, waste person yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so if you don't already know, uh, when organic material breaks down in landfills, uh, it creates methane gas, and which can also be cleaned and refined and turned into renewable natural gas and then pumped into the pipeline and used. Uh, so it is it can be a renewable resource. Uh, if you, the leaks are, sh uh, sh like there's low leakage and it's coming from uh, sources that would normally just turn into methane. And so it, there's a long, big conversation out there about how, um, what the best way to turn methane leakage into, me, or sorry, methane and organic materials into renewable natural gas, which is kind of a whole other conversation. But the, the short bit is that when organics breaks down, if in certain environments, it creates methane. And so you want to incentivize and encourage cities to take organic material instead of maybe landfilling it uh, to either turn it into natural gas and then make sure that natural gas doesn't leak from pipelines and whatnot in the oil and gas sector. Uh, so our, we are very connected in a way that I can be a renewable supplier to their sector if it's done well. Does that sort of answer your yeah, question? Yeah, no, okay. yeah, thank you very much. That, yeah. That's exactly what I was just uh, yeah. making sure that, if we would, that the audience would be able to understand. Um, I think one more, uh, my, my next question would be, can these tools be sort of tailored for countries? Uh, we, we know that uh, no countries alike. These are tools. Uh, do you think that they can be sort of tweaked uh, so that they can be used in each place? Yeah, I mean, our, our, the tools that we had designed for the Global Methane Initiative are really sort of municipal or regional focused. But, you know, if someone was dedicated to doing many regions as one analysis, you could definitely do a, a country with, the, with our tools. Uh, it would it just it would be, you know, a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach. So, okay. yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, fantastic. So, um, I, we haven't thought about it, to be honest. Um, uh, and uh, I, I don't, well, for, from my view, it doesn't necessarily make sense um, because, uh, um, you know, the, the tool um, is designed for a company to go detailed, to understand the equipment that they have, um, how they run it, right? They, they need to understand how many compressors they have, what kind of compressors they have, what's the volume inside the compressors, right? How many times do they stop them? Um, how many times do they do maintenance and vend them completely? Um, so it's, you know, how long are the pipelines? Uh, what is the diameter of the pipelines? It's not information necessarily that you need to go to, into international level, on your national level, but what you need to do is that you need to have regulations that, that require all of your oil and gas operators to report the aggregate information to you, you know, maybe subdivided in certain categories that would allow you to make policy decisions and be informed and obviously report um, um, to the to, to Paris Agreement framework. Um, so for, for the national um, governments, I think I wouldn't see this as a, as a priority. It's, it's quite complex. It also involves a lot of confidential information about the specific operation of a company. Um, and without it, you wouldn't be able to make the right estimates. Okay. Um, and if you generalize too much, then you kind of miss the point to me, yeah. you know. Um, you see, you, as a government, you should be collecting information and implementing policies based on good data rather than based on something, you know, just generalized to give you an idea. They're already doing it. 
um, under the current inventory approaches, that's what they're doing. They're using um, IPCC emission factors, they're applying it to very large uh, activity data categories, right? So they are doing it. Uh, what we're missing is, is specifically the connection between this top-down and bottom-up and, and, and how to make it work on national level. Olga, you mentioned um, OGMP. Yes. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what it is so that uh, the audience can also know a little bit about it? Uh, well, the uh, oil and gas methane partnership, uh, um, you know, is a, is a, is a coalition. I wouldn't be able to describe it probably legally, you know, I'm not <laughs> private to, to, you know, how they organize, but it's a, it, it's a coalition of, of oil, and, um, oil and gas companies um, that are um, committed to reducing the emissions. Um, and the most important commitment, uh, uh, well, both committing emissions and, and reporting. To me, the reporting is very important because without it, you can't really commit to reducing. Yeah. And if you're committing, you're basically making um, without knowing the data and understanding how you'll reduce, um, you know, it, it's more of a visual thinking, you know, yeah. but um, most of the time um, when management takes a decision, they want to understand what is it they are making a decision about. Yeah. Um, so the reporting part of it is, is um, very important. It, it, it's a um, most fundamental one and it, um, there's a framework, you know, there's all, uh, all companies are supposed to provide very detailed um, sort of category-based information um, on their emissions that are activity-based. Um, and there are several layers, so you can you can join to GMP and be on a lower layer, mm -hmm. um, sort of lower level, um, just report general emissions. And you can go um, sort of higher up in the levels, um, and they even have a gold standard okay. so you, that you can fulfill and you can be a sort of a gold standard uh, um, company. And MIST allows you to achieve the gold standard. MIST allows you to report. Um, to achieve gold standard, you actually need to measure um, your, um, you need to measure your emissions, you need to do the surveys. Okay. You can't just rely on the calculations and engineering data. Mm -hmm. You need to verify it okay. um, with uh, um, measurement equipment, with specifically, I think, just before we started, right, you've seen the camera. Yeah. Um, there's also, the camera is, is used for identification. There's also quantification equipment, mm -hmm. and you can quantify specific leaks. So you have a good statistical database, and then you adjust um, whatever you have recorded. You can adjust your engineering calculations yes. um, to sort of the real life. Um, and um, that is the gold standard that's required for GMP. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, Christoph, sort of, this, this is uh, maybe a little bit more difficult, but uh, do you, at do you, can you engage one-on-one -on -one with countries and explain these uh, toolkits and explain, like sort of gather them or have regional yeah. uh, meetings and sort of go through these things with them? Before I get on to that, can I just yeah. quite pick up on one thing that Olga put? Please fully do. agree with everything that you said. Measurement, reporting, verification is, is, is crucial. And it's absolutely fundamental for tackling methane um, in the long term. But I think we also need to recognize there are some things in terms of regulations yeah. that can be done immediately. Of course. There are there's certain prescriptive measures which governments can say, for example, leak detection and repair. Oh yeah, absolutely. Part of the, the, part of the problem I think we had 10 years ago was this idea that, well, we don't know anything about this, therefore we're not having any policies, we're not having any regulations. And we're very keen to emphasize to everyone who asks that there are things you can do now, today. You can Absolutely, you need to improve on everything to do with understanding of your, your, your emissions. And in fact, some of the measures you can put in place today, like the leak detection repair, like, I don't know, banning flaring and, and, and certain things, will actually help you improve your understanding as you do them. So you can, you can, you can be reducing emissions while improving your overall, overall understanding. On the, on the point of, of engagement with, with countries specifically, I think our view on this has changed slightly in light of the Global Methane Pledge. Mm -hmm. we, we have been thinking about trialing the regulatory roadmap and the toolkit with, with individual countries, mm -hmm. particularly those which have, appear to have high levels of emissions today, and we still intend to do that. But part of the problem with the Global Methane Pledge is it's been so successful. We've now got 100 countries. It's going to be very difficult to engage with 100 individual countries. So we need to be a bit more creative about how we are going to have that engagement. Um, whether this is through round tables, get everyone in the, in the room together to, to, to talk through the details, that's going to be just as important, I think, as tailoring 
that toolkit, that roadmap for, for countries. We absolutely want to do that. And there's certain things you can do. I mean, the roadmap is written in English yeah. and that's not applicable to lots of countries around the world. Translating it into the language of countries where the regulators can really understand it is, is very important. Tailoring it in terms of the emissions profile, you know, if it's more oil and gas and, and a little bit of coal or it's very heavy on um, waste emissions, you know, so that the, the countries can re appreciate the differences. Tailoring it in that way, I think, is also helpful for them to kind of get the get them kind of buy in on this so that they whenever they want to deploy the regulations they're doing it from a position of knowledge so we want to go through that process with a number of very important countries those seem to be highest em emitting while also having these you know bigger discussions to get everyone everyone on board okay so we're seeing that the global methane pledge is really um putting us on our toes and uh giving a sense of urgency and understanding that we have to be able to, to be successful, we need to do this on a large scale. So we, everybody has a role to play. Uh, companies have tools already to be able to like, uh, geographically gather data from a very precise level, analyze them and follow through. But governments also have a responsibility to regulate and to enforce the regulation and to improve it gradually as they get better information. And local governments at least also have a chance. Like they, ha they have a shot at doing something, right? Local governments definitely have a way to participate in the waste sector yep. uh, they, with, this, with this kit of tools that will be on the GMI's website. Um, and GMI is? Global uh, Methane Initiative, sorry. Global, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and you know, especially that is, I mean, an issue that city governments have full control over is what you do with your waste. So uh, it's something that, you know, next week, anyone list, if you work for a city government, you could start, uh, just download the tools and start entering the, the data you have most. City governments have data on, you know, how much waste they're collecting, what their population is, uh, you know, how much are they recycling, how much are they composting, and so you can use, you should have most of the data sort of in your universe to sort of start planning tomorrow. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, with, um, so I'll, I'll try to ask this, this question to myself as well. Um, how could, um, I guess, how could that might our tool be, be um, improved? If I you think, want, I can ask you. If you yeah, want. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Wait, 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 um, <laughs> so I think that what we've noticed is that countries are suddenly trying to compare years. Um, they're trying to, um, our tool is, is basically used for one year, no? It gives you the estimate on one year. So I think that we might be able to develop our tool to make sure that we can see uh, progression and countries can keep track of emissions and see how they're doing. Um, and maybe we even want to sort of, uh, I haven't spoken about this with my boss, but uh, <laughs> maybe things think. to do with health, no? Like how reducing methane emissions is actually helping uh, improve the health of people around these places, which is very important. Um, so uh, I guess sort of my, my, one of my final questions, I guess, would be, um, how does this influence policy, no? Um, I guess... Uh, <laughs> Well, our, our, our tools are so you can plan policy. Maybe not policy is on the scale that our, my panelists work on, but yeah. uh, municipal governments can say, oh, we're going to invest in uh, anti-digesters. We're going to invest in landfill capture. We're going to invest in, um, uh, we're, and we're going to take that gas we capture and we're going to build a power plant. You know, we, we governments can, uh, smaller governments can make decisions that are sort of in their universe of things they can control. And so, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's how... Olga, do you think this yeah. applies to you? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, it does actually, because I, I, I fully, um, I fully agree. Because that um, you know you you can actually regulate even you know before reporting. It wasn't um, wasn't that you need to have the data first, um, but uh, it's important to also have the data yeah. um, that you can improve um, the regulatory um, so the regulatory pressure um, on the companies, um, and especially you know because we work with national oil companies. I, I've sort of, sort of so somehow left it out because for us it's a given. But the, the tool that we have developed is free. It's been paid by philanthropic funding. Um, so very often for, for um, these governments, you know, a developing country government, um, this is the best information they can possibly ever get. They might um, not 
you know, without it, they would not be able to even to understand that, uh, you know, the scale of the problem. Because once when they're using um, very generic calculations for national injuries, they're not exactly aware of the scale of the problem in their own countries. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yes, um, at one point, you know, they, um, they, they're very, you know, when a country is dependent economically on the oil and gas sector, um, it's very, very difficult for them to regulate it and to be very strict without it. Um, but data encourages that and exposes uh, certain things, you know, that are quite obvious to us for experts, but not, might not be so obvious to them, you know, in their capacities. Of course, of course. No, I mean, there's a lot of countries that depend on this. Uh, that depends on, they depend on oil or gas for their revenue uh, and to pay for a lot of public expenditure. So uh, we have to, we, 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 I think we have to understand that, uh, that they are in a very different position from other countries that maybe have a more diversified economy, I guess. Yes. Um, so no, absolutely. Within the, um, within the regulatory roadmap and the toolkit, we, we obviously, the whole aim of that is to encourage countries to bring about policies. And we had four kind of key areas in which they could bring in, bring in policies. One is on prescriptive, which is a bit what we were just discussing in terms of you can just say ban flaring. You can, you can just say ban high bleed pneumatic controllers. You can ha stipulate leak detection repair programs. If you've got a slightly more advanced knowledge, you can probably bring about more um, performance based. So things like a bit like the global methane pledge of certain reduction target or a certain intensity target or a certain level of, of um, emissions. There's also economic policies you can bring about. Um, you can start to put a price on some of these emissions. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in some countries. Norway, for example, applies a price or a, a tax to methane emissions from, its, um, f from any of its um, platforms where production is taking place. And then you have information-based policies where you, just, you, you aim to improve the information, the understanding, and that will by itself will almost certainly bring down, down, down emissions. If you understand that there's large leaks happening, you're probably very quickly going to stop those very big leaks from happening. The point from the regulatory roadmap that we make is that every country is in a different position and will want to choose diff different options that exist. There's not going to be one of just of those which will apply to everybody. They, you know, given your circumstances in a country, you might want to choose one and then be working towards another. And it's very important within the policies that they they are clear about the long-term objective. And mm -hmm. for example, the Global Methane Pledge is very clear on its long-term objective. But in terms of the regulations, you have to be flexible. And this has not always been the case with how regulations have been, hmm. been set in place. The regulations supporting the long-term policy, sometimes they're, they're, they're almost too prescriptive. They say, you have to do this and there's no other way of doing it. That's often not the best way, just because it can, it can slow down innovation. For example, some of the regulations that were in place five or 10 years ago wouldn't have allowed companies to, to use satellite measurements or remote sensing measurements to, to understand what leaks could be occurring in their, in their equipment. Now we're seeing the regulations, the next kind of wave of regulations coming through. They're a bit more receptive to that idea. They say you, can, you have to do this at a minimum, but there is other equivalent things you can do. And if you can demonstrate that that's just as good as what, what our, our regulation says, that's good for us. So, you want those regulations to be able to be a bit more flexible, a bit more adaptive to, to encourage companies to, to, to innovate in this area, to do things in the cheapest way and the most effective way possible. Okay, okay. Well, um, this is, this is uh, really great. I think that um, I would like to encourage everybody um, to reach out, everybody in the audience. Uh, please get in touch with uh, the International Energy Agency, with Carbon Limits, uh, with App Solutions, uh, with Cleaner Task Force. We are here to uh, collaborate with everybody around the world. Um, uh, all of these have sort of a lot of, uh, you said, the, you, you mentioned the barrier, which was language, no? Um, but I know that in Carbon Limits, you, you guys speak a lot of languages, <laughs> the International <laughs> Energy Agency as well, you folks as well, and if not, I'm sure we can not. find something. <laughs> yes, um, someone at App will speak la the language, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll manage, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure we'll manage. Um, and Cleaner Task Force as well, we have sort of a diverse team, and we're happy to work with anybody around the world on this issue. Um, we are all partners, and we are complementary, uh, and uh, we're very happy to at least also talk about right. waste because yeah. um, we've been focusing so much on oil and gas methane emissions that uh, we've sort of uh, not realized that 15% uh, of the world emissions 
uh, come from the waste sector. Uh, it's, it's very important, no? Countries that don't have oil and gas can focus on waste, no? Mm -hmm. So it's super important. And our sectors are connected in the yeah. sense that once the gas methane is collected, it can be refined and from biogas to renewable and natural gas, and then it becomes their problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we won't uh, just hand the problems over to anybody. <laughs> we'll solve them.